Boris Johnson's position on conversion therapy has led to a backlash from some Tory MPs. The government is pushing ahead with a ban on conversion therapy, which aims to change the sexual orientation of lesbian, gay and bisexual people. However, ministers are ready to exclude trans people from the ban of conversion therapy in favour of what they call a more sensitive approach. Joining me now to discuss this issue are barristers Sarah Fillimore and Dennis Kavanagh. Everyone. <laughs> now, thank you both very much for joining me today. Now, Sarah, I want to come to you first because this issue has caused a huge confusion across the board. There's a protest going on today mm -hmm. about it. And when people discuss conversion therapy, it feels like often... Uh, depending on who you're talking to, people mean different things. Can you sort of clarify what's happened here? What is the background? Uh, yeah, it, it is complicated. As simply as I can, most people understand conversion therapy is an attempt to persuade somebody out of their sexual orientation. That can be by praying for them at one end of the scale to physical assault and corrective rape at the other. So there's no evidence that it's effective in any way. There's also, however, no real evidence that it's prevalent in this country. However, I think most people are perfectly happy with the law sending a clear message mm. that to attempt to convert someone out of their sexual orientation is just a waste of time and causes harm. So we don't have a problem. No one has a problem with that. The difficulty has arisen is this. There has been an elision of homosexuality with gender yep. identity. And these are two substantially different things. And they mean very different things for children and adults. And that's where it starts to get really messy. Because for four years, the government were quite happily going along with, we will bring in um, this bill, we will outlaw it in time for our wonderful shiny conference in the summer. Hmm. <laughs> um, but things began to happen to, disrail, to derail this. The most important thing, I think, in January of this year, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission which was the body set up by statute to promote and protect the rights in the Equality Act. So it's a really authoritative body. Mm -hmm. They wrote a response to the government's consultation going, well, hang on a minute. You haven't defined the two key terms of your proposed legislation. What do you mean by transgender? And what do you mean by talking conversion therapy? So those are without definition. And the problem we know for children is this. The vast majority, I think studies say between 60 to 90 percent of children who are gender variant, who express unhappiness with their sexed bodies, if they're left to go through puberty, they will desist and they will be happy, often as, as happy gay children. Exactly. So this is the big problem. If the consultation had proceeded without this intervention, there would have been a law that potentially criminalised offering therapy to these children. So that was January. Then in February, the CAS report issued its interim report, only interim, already 112 pages, pointing out we've got a culture. Th this kind of treatment is like no other. There is a culture of unquestioning affirmation. So young children would say, I feel a bit confused and unhappy, and, and which of us didn't when going through yep. puberty? Then they're immediately put on a path of puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones and surgery. The consequences for their adult life are grave and serious with regard to their fertility and their adult sexual function. So after, I think, the report from the EHRC and the CAS review, no responsible government could have continued along that path. But what we've got in response are people out on the streets protesting. We've got MPs writing newspaper articles saying this is appalling. So I think it's a wider problem here, not just for these children. It, it's a sort of a death of an ability to look at the evidence and to deal with it in a rational way. We've just got people running around like headless chickens shrieking torture. Well, well, and they've it's, it's they've very misunderstood, wrong. haven't they? Because they, they, when they think of conversion therapy, they think of the kind of thing that existed maybe back in the 60s where people were, you know, they had electric shock therapy yeah. to, to, to quote unquote cure them of their homosexuality. Yeah. And they think that's the same as a therapist talking to a child about feelings of gender dysphoria. Mm -hmm. um, can I come to you on this, Dennis? Because yeah. why does this have a particularly uh, dangerous ramification for gay children? Well, the, the problem we've got at the moment, as I think we've spoken about in the past, is that homophobia often attends 
um, referrals to gender identity services. And I've spoken to you in the past about a case called Appleby and Tavistock, where the Times report on it said there was a dark joke amongst staff. Soon there will be no gay children left. This is a new form of conversion therapy. We, we've got a situation here where referrals from young girls to the Tavistock between 2009 and 2019 went up by over 5,000%. Now, why is that? is that? Is that down to social contagion? Is that down to fashion? What is that? What nobody is that? knows and nobody's bothered to look. Right. Now, you know, if you had a 5,000% increase in any other medical condition, someone would say, hang on, what's going on here? But when we look at this cohort, we've got gay children, autistic children, children leaving care. No one seems to care. And more than that, we've got ideologically driven charities who are saying... This, basically. It's not what's in the best interests of the child. It's what's in the best interests of the ideology. And in that same case I just mentioned, Appleby and Tavistock, the court said one of the problems doctors here have is this. There are charities which are making clinical decisions more difficult. Now, that's a lawyer's phrase, clinical decisions more difficult. What does that mean? That means we've got children subject to lifelong medicalization because nobody was prepared to say... Um, I'm interested in what's going on here. So, so just to be absolutely clear about this, so a, a gender non-conforming child, a child who isn't typically masculine, it's a, say a girl who, is, who isn't typically feminine, doesn't like wearing dresses but likes playing football, or the reverse, a little, a little boy who prefers being girly in, in the traditional yeah. sense. Wait, th these, these kids go along to the clinics and they are told, well, if you feel like you're not a boy or not a girl... That's true. You're definitely not. Is that what's going on? Yeah, well, the, what they're being told is, uh, they're being told, you've got, you were born in the wrong body. Mm -hmm. And we need to fix you. We need to correct you. And a lot of these kids will just turn out to be gay. Well, as, as Sarah just said, the vast majority grow up to be happy, well-adjusted homosexuals. So this is, this is confusing, Sarah, because in effect, when uh, we talk about conversion therapy for gay people, that's one thing. And then we've got um, therapy relating to gender dysphoria, which, talk, which, which is where therapists are able to explore why children have these feelings. But that is being bracketed and branded alongside what we all agree is a terrible thing, a gay, gay conversion therapy. But this is, this is very different. Is that what's going on? I think that's exactly what's going on. And as Dennis said, the focus is on the ideology, not the children. Right. The children just appear to be being fed into this ideological sausage machine. Mm -hmm. If you express any confusion or distaste for your sex body, you must be another sex, another gender. And it's, not, it's completely different to a sexual orientation, which is, as far as I'm aware, Dennis will correct me if I'm wrong, is fixed fairly early on, is pretty stable. I mean, obviously, people can be bisexual. But it's not the same as being a, a young person with vulnerabilities, possibly autism, trauma in your background. I mean, just for an example, in the whole of my career, 20 years, up until 2020, I had not one single case involving a transgender child. I deal with child protection cases when local authorities remove children from their parents because they're at risk of significant harm. In 2020, I had three. And it's going to be interesting to see then how many in 2021 and 2022. But there's something very wrong going on here in that vulnerable children, it's simply assumed that it must be an issue about your gender identity. And we all know what the treatment for that is, lifelong medication and possibly surgery. OK, but but if, you know, in some of the cases, I mean, you say a lot of these people, a lot of these kids desist if they're allowed to go through puberty in the natural way. But then some won't and some will yeah. have gender dysphoria and they will be trans people as adults. So where does, but, but, but where does that leave them? Well, what we've got at the moment is a surface that doesn't help them at all because it's completely overwhelmed. So for people that do need this treatment, because of an affirmation-only approach, because doctors are being silenced, because doctors are being told not to challenge, not only does this damage um, people who'd otherwise just grow up to be well-adjusted homosexuals, it damages trans people because they're stuck in a situation where they're at the back of an overwhelmed service that can't attend to their needs because the doctors and the wider structures are not differentiating accurately enough between people with gender dysphoria that's going to persist and going to be part of their life, um, who need to be helped, who deserve the best medical care possible, and people who are being caught up in this system because we're too afraid as a society to ask questions because of allegations of hatefulness. And that, and that is ideology over child protection. And yet it's the opposite, isn't it, of hate? Because, you know, you, you hear testimonies from various people who detransitioned since. And the one thing that recurs and comes back again and again, they always say, 
we were just affirmed. Our feelings were affirmed. No one asked questions. No one, no one tried to talk, us about, talk to us about this. And now they regret it. Uh, uh, and that's a real problem, isn't it, at the heart of the system? It, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a broader problem in that there are moves throughout the child protection system. You must listen to the voice of the child. You must hear what the child says. And to a degree, I absolutely agree with that. But the problem is when you're nine and Dr Mike Webberley is offering you testosterone, you can't yeah. possibly yeah. be able to give informed consent about what that means. And I'll just remind people of one of the statements which the Tavistock put before the High Court in the first hearing of the Bell case, which they actually thought would help them, was from a child, I think, aged about 12, who said, well, I was asked about relationships and stuff, but it's not really on my radar. And the Tavistock thought that actually helped their case to show that this child, who was now going to lose probably all chance yes. of ever having their own children, having an adult sexual response, he would probably become uh, not be able to have an orgasm. This child so, was to make that decision and we just had to listen to it. And to be it. clear, the, the Tavistock Clinic is the uh, paediatric gender clinic uh, run by the NHS. It's the only specialist clinic and as the CAS review said, the model just doesn't work. And as Dennis has said, I quite accept there's going to be, I think a very small minority, but there's going to be a small minority of children who are gender dysphoric, who will be assisted mm. by medication and surgery, but they are a tiny, tiny minority. And obviously the consequences for those who are not gender dysphoric, I mean... You can't put bits of the body back on once they've been taken off. We're not Lego. And there have been, there have been um, whistleblowers from the Tavistock Clinic, and they've been treated quite badly, haven't they? Well, look they? what happened to Sonia Appleby. Yeah. I mean, Can she's... you tell us about that? Because people may not know. Well, Sonia Appleby, Appleby was the lead safeguarding person at GID, so it was her job to look out for these children. She found herself sidelined. She found that staff were told not to bring concerns to her. She was able to inform the Tavistock about her fears that this was internalised homophobia from a lot of parents because they were saying, I just can't possibly have a gay child. But all these So that's concerns... a common thing, is it? Where the... Yep. I think, as, as Dennis may have mentioned, it was a joke, apparently, at the Tavistock that soon there wouldn't be any gay people left. So, so wait, so Dennis, let's bring you in. There. So is, to an extent, is this idea almost medicalising homosexuality, trying to... Uh, fix it, I suppose, if, if you like. I, I, I'm afraid that there is that dark element to it because what it comes to, as I think we've discussed before, is, is this. If you're playing with the wrong toys as a child, some adults say, well, that is evidence that you need a lifetime of medication. Mm. And if that isn't correcting gender non-conforming behaviour, which, which very strongly correlates with homosexuality, then I don't know what is. But, you know, I was a gender non-conforming child. I didn't play football. You know, lots yeah. of the people I know didn't go along with the traditional roots. Uh, and the idea that people would have intervened and said, maybe you're not in the right body, that seems, well, I mean, almost abusive. Yeah, it, 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 it's abusive. Um, it, it's picking on gay kids. It's picking on autistic kids. It's picking on care leavers. And then to wrap up, as is happening at the moment, proper clinical care, and actually investigating what is going on. And to say that a discussion with a child about whether or not they are trans is conversion therapy, which is what is being, what was being proposed, is frankly a, a work of Orwellian nightmare. We've been living through an age of conversion therapy as that dark joke at the Tavistock demonstrates. So this is, this is very confusing then because a lot of this is about language, but it's also about the reaction of activists. Now, I've been looking over social media, which is probably the worst place to look, mm. but even if you look at the protests and what people are saying, the, the, the view, and I, I, I believe it's a sincerely held view, is that people who are objecting uh, to this, to, to what the Tavistock have done and the, the affirmate, affirmatory approach, that people think that is genuine hatred. People equate this to people who wanted to... Uh, change gay people, fix gay people mm. back in the day. Is that really what we do? How do we deal with that when that's the opposition? We're in a really difficult position. I've thought about this long and hard in the last three years that I've been involved in this. I think there's a tiny, a small minority of people who know exactly what they're doing. Their desire is for sex to be removed as a legally protected characteristic and replaced by gender expression. And I think there's a, a much larger number of people who, for all sorts of noble reasons, are going along with this because their analysis begins and ends with the mantra, stop torturing trans kid, trans rights are human rights. They don't think any further beyond that. And I, I do think most of them are motivated entirely for good and noble reasons. But right. I, I'm just so increasingly shocked. It's not just the man, the woman on the street going along this line. There are MPs writing articles saying this is appalling, the government must act, we must have conversion therapy bans. 
And these are our legislators. So this is not just the welfare of a whole generation of children, which is bad enough. This is about the rule of law and the health of our democracy. So is the, is the best approach to stop calling this conversion therapy, the idea of a doctor talking to a child or trying to work out what might be wrong with a, gender, a child who claims to be in the wrong body, we should stop calling that conversion therapy because the implication of that is they are converting from something innate and fixed. Exactly. I think as the Cast Review pointed out very well, we've got two separate camps. There's one that thinks gender expression is something innate and immutable. And there's another group, which I personally think are right, that say gender expression is something that's fluid, is a reflection of your circumstances and your environment. And not all children who express unhappiness with their sex body will go on to express that unhappiness. But the problem is, once you've given cross-sex hormones to a nine-year-old, yeah. the door is shut. Mm. And that's what really, yeah. really worries me. So I think, look, we've just got to go back to basics. You cannot change your sex. If you're unhappy with the sex that you were born into, then that's really sad, and that is something we need to help you with. But there's a multiplicity of approaches. A very small minority of children may need medical and surgical intervention. A vast majority of those children will need somebody to talk to who's non-judgmental, who can guide them through the confusion and upset that they feel. And we've got to be alive to the fact that a lot of this is internalised homophobia. The quote I heard that shocked me the most was a man saying of his little boy, I didn't want to see my son mincing. I wanted to see yeah. my daughter running. So this little girl, this little boy, became a girl to suit her father's pleasure. Yeah. And I think, as Dennis has commented, a reckoning is coming. This will be a generation of children whose lives have been blighted. And where were the adults? Where are the children's yeah. commissioners? There are four of them. Yeah. England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Where are they? Yeah. What have they said? Nothing. Or, or where are the autism charities yes. on this? Why, when Kira Bell went to the High Court, Kira Bell, a lesbian, a detransitioner, uh, and said, this, uh, I, I went through this partly because I was suffering with internalised homophobia, where were the gay charities? Mm. They should have been stood there with her. They should have been saying, this is happening to lesbians. Mm. But no one's on the pitch. As, as you say, Sarah, they, we don't see the Children's Commission. Where are the children's charities? Mm. Where is this vast apparatus yeah. that we have in the United Kingdom of government bodies, of charity bodies, all of whom are very good at attending black tie dinners and, and putting, out tweet, uh, putting out tweets? Mm. Where are they? when these kids are in court saying, I've been permanently damaged because you lot wouldn't ask doctors questions. Well, look, uh, this is a very, very complicated issue, as I think has been exposed yeah. by the fact, that, by the way that we've been talking about it. But it is important that we have these conversations, that they continue to do so. So thank you both, Sarah and Dennis, for coming on. Thank you very much. About this. Thank you.